All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, so tonight, of course, we're going to look at a new sutta. Uh, in fact, we might look at a couple of new suttas uh, tonight. Um, just a quick reminder in terms of where we're at at the Dharma Doors here. So we, for a while now, we've been going through the connected discourses. We have now moved over to the Anamataga Samyutta, the collection of suttas that are about things with no discernible beginning or be beginninglessness. So these are all suttas that are connected because they share the theme of the topic of beginninglessness. Now, in particular, they are kind of talking about what we know of or what we call samsara. So samsara is, of course, this Buddhist word, a Sanskrit word, for the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, this kind of endless, beginningless cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. And I want to remind you that what happened was, is that we were looking at a bunch of suttas, and they were all connected in the topic of the skandhas. So we were looking at the aggregates, the, the skandhas, and then the last sutta that we were talking about dealing with the skandhas was it was talking about how attachment to, clinging to, identifying with or as the skandhas puts you in this endless round of samsara that has no discernible beginning. So there was this connection between the aggregates clinging to the aggregates, and then being trapped in samsara. That makes getting out of samsara pretty clear <laughs> as far as not attaching to the aggregates is sort of liberation in that way. So then what happened was, is then we moved over to this whole section dealing with teachings about samsara. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we did the first sutta of this collection last week called the Tinyakattaha Sutta uh, on grass and wood. The thing about this sutta that we, we talked a lot about a bunch of different aspects of this sutta last week, but I just want to remind you that what this sutta, basically what the Buddha said, <clears throat> he basically says, if you were to go throughout the entire country, the entire continent, if you were to go picking up every stick, leaf, blade of grass, anything, and to pull it into a giant pile, and for each blade of grass, if you said, all right, this blade of grass represents my mother, and this blade of grass represents my mother's mother. And this stick represents my mother's mother's mother. The Buddha said that you could do this for every blade of grass and stick and bush in the continent. And you would exhaust all of the trees and branches and sticks and leaves in the continent. And still, there would be no discernible beginning to this process in terms of you would never find the first mother. <clears throat> Tonight, I'm going to start with the second sutta in this collection. So if you have the big collection of suttas from the wisdom tradition, the second sutta is called the Pathavi Sutta the earth. And I'm doing this sutta sort of as a, just to get us warmed up. This is actually in a way more of a review of the sutta from last week, 
I really want to focus tonight on the third sutta in this section. Oh, and by the way, if you have this book, I'm on page 652. <clears throat> so I really want to look at the third sutta in here, but we need to quickly talk about something from the Patavi Sutta. So really quickly, because these are short suttas, this is the second sutta in this collection, the Patavi Sutta, the earth. It's very similar to the first sutta with a little difference. The Buddha said, oh, and this happened at Savati, at Shravasti, the Buddha said, bhikkhus, this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Suppose, bhikkhus, <clears throat> suppose, bhikkhus, someone reduced the earth. <laughs> if someone reduced this great earth, to balls of clay the size of jujube kernels and put them down one at a time saying, this is my father, this is my father's father. The sequence of that person's fathers and grandfathers would not come to an end. Yet this great earth would be used up and exhausted. Why? For what reason? Because, bhikkhus, this samsara is without a discernible beginning. <clears throat> a first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. For such a long time, bhikkhus, you've experienced suffering, anguish, and disaster, and you've swelled the cemeteries. It is enough to experience revulsion towards all formations, all samskaras, enough to become dispassionate towards them. It's enough to be liberated from them. All right. So it's kind of basically the same sutta as the first one with the exchange of fathers and grandfathers for mothers and grandmothers. So the message is the exact same, but I do want to mention one thing really quickly before we move on to the next sutta. I want to mention something about, well, I guess you could say that I, I either, depending upon how you look at this, I either want to say something about the Buddha, like as a person, like as a teacher, or I want to say something about Buddhist literature or, you know, suttas in that way. So take it either way. The Buddha or Buddhist literature, it has a certain, the Buddha or Buddhist literature has a certain way of teaching. And the only, you know, the only way that I can really kind of put that very clearly in terms of what I'm talking about is that if you read a lot of suttas, you begin to notice that the Buddha is kind of funny, <laughs> or at least I think the Buddha is hilarious. I really think that it, it, he's very funny. <clears throat> and so one of the aspects of that humor are these hyperbolic examples. Because if you think about it, it's kind of funny to talk about reducing the entire planet to tiny little balls and then one at a time counting out father, grandfather, grand, great grandfather, great, 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 great. It's kind of funny, but it gets you thinking and it is an interesting way of teaching in that sense. Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out is and the reason why I put it the way I do, which is you could kind of look at this as a quality of the Buddha or a quality of Buddhist literature. And the reason why I put it that way is this particular little trait of the Buddha to speak hyperbolically in these really wild examples, 
that tendency it continues and what i mean is is that in the mahayana buddhist tradition the hyperbole starts to get really wild i mean we're talking like super hyperbolic now if you are kind of a um i don't know what you would put, how i would put it you know some buddhists believe that the buddha the historical person some people believe that historical person said taught all the sutras meaning the early the, these early uh kind of uh hinayana suttas the mahayana suttas and even beyond and if you look at it that way that it was all the Buddha, then the Buddha seems to have started off kind of mild with his hyperbolic examples. And maybe as he got older and a little crazier, and I mean that in a good way, meaning like brilliantly wild, he maybe started using even more and more wild examples. And they just kept getting wilder because maybe everybody was used to the, the regular stuff. And so he had to like raise the bar that's one way of looking at it. There's another way of looking at it, of course, which is that that this kind of humor, this kind of hyperbole, you can kind of look at it that it's it's kind of baked in. It's kind of like baked into the Buddhist tradition. And so when the Mahayana tradition began, they just kept that trend going in that way. So you could look at it that way too, that, oh yeah, the Buddha taught these suttas and he was a funny guy and he used all kinds of hyperbole and wild examples. And then the Mahayana tradition just went kind of wild with that style, if you will. I've got one other option for you though. This is a little more like kind of quasi middle pathy in that sense. Another way to think about it is if you, and I suppose what I'm about to say is more of a Mahayana approach to all of this, but you could also think of it as that you could think of it in terms of the Buddha not being a specific historical person, but Buddha as the enlightened mind. And what I mean by that is now, if we understand that if we take the Mahayana seriously, which is that there is no distinction between Buddhas because the enlightened mind is non-dual. So how could there be two enlightened states of mind? No, no, no. Duality is called this. <laughs> Hi called me and you. Buddha is non-dual. And so there can't really be two Buddha minds. There's Buddha mind. And maybe Buddha mind is funny. Maybe Buddha mind is hyperbolic and uses wild examples. And what I mean by that is, is that maybe when one, an individual, becomes awakened, and becomes Buddha, becomes a Buddha, an awakened being, maybe that's just the way the enlightened mind works. And it worked in terms of the Buddha, the historical person, that when he accessed that state of mind, he became funny, used hyperbole and all kinds of wild examples. And maybe that kept happening, that people got enlightened and then spoke a certain way and used a certain style of teaching. Those are three different options. I would I would suggest being a good Buddhist and not choosing one of those, but being comfortable with the possibility and more possibilities. So, all right. So I, I'm drawing your attention to this because it's going to continue in the next sutta, and I'm going to have a little more to say about this style. But any questions off the bat about that idea? Yeah, Tanya.
Do we? Oh. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so I just had a thought, like, you know, we all have Buddha nature, and in some sense, Buddha mind. And so if people were writing sutras after the Buddha died, in some way, maybe they were channeling him. In a, oh. Do you know what I mean by channeling? You know what I mean? Like, like you know, yeah, it we doesn't don't even... matter that it's not, it wasn't the historical, because does that, you know, you kind of see where I'm going with that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And by the way, Tanya, really quickly, I'm glad you mentioned such an idea. So it's pretty conclusive at this point. Um, there's a lot of scholarship that's been done the last 10, 15 years on the emergence of Mahayana Buddhism and like the like where did this come from where, where did all these new sutras come from and where did all these new ideas come from well in the world of Buddhist scholarship again over the last 10 or 15 years a few people have really kind of identified where they think maybe some of these sutras were coming from and what it is 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 that we have a lot of bodhisattva samadhi or meditation guidebooks, if you will, that talk about going into meditative states, going into kind of trances, and going and visiting Buddhas, and hearing Dharma teachings that have never been heard before in this earth of ours, and then coming out of the trance and saying, Thus have I heard, <laughs> because they were there and they heard it. And so there's actual like Mahayana meditation manuals that describe what Tanya just called channeling. I wouldn't necessarily call it channeling, but you see what, why I would think of it. So they're pretty straightforward with the possibility of kind of going into meditative states, having visions or visitations of Buddhas, and then reporting what they heard as if it were no different than this in that way so that's where some people seem to think that's the where the mahayana sutras are coming from so yeah noe please uh, so, uh, anything to do with pure land it has everything to do with pure lands <laughs> indeed all right so let's move on to the next sutra so we can kind of dive into the, um, like, again, th that first sutra was sort of just a reminder of last week in that way. So this sutra is tough. It's called the Asu Sutta, which is the tears. And so I can't promise that this is going to be happy <laughs> in that sense, like a, a joyful sutra exactly. But Let's, um, yeah, we have a lot to talk about with this one. So so this one is the third sutta in the section. Again, it's called the Asu, A-S-S-U, sutta. Also at Savati. Bhikkhus. This samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. What do you think, bhikkhus? Which is more? The stream of tears that you have shed as you roamed and wandered on through this long course, weeping and wailing because of because of being united with the disagreeable and being separated from the agreeable. This, which is more, all those tears you've shed or the water of the four great oceans? And the bhikkhus replied, as we understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the stream of tears that we have shed as we roamed and wandered on through this long course, weeping and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable, this alone is more than the water of the four great oceans. 
good, good bhikkhus. It is good that you understand the Dharma taught by me in such a way. The stream of tears that you have shed as you roamed and wandered on through this long course, weeping and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable, this alone is more than the water of the four great oceans. For a long time, bhikkhus, you have experienced the death of a mother. As you have experienced this, weeping and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable, the stream of tears that you have shed is more than the water of the four great oceans. For a long time, bhikkhus, you have experienced the death of a father. As you have experienced this, weeping and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable, the stream of tears that you have shed is more than the water in the four great oceans. For a long time, bhikkhus, you have experienced the death of a brother, the death of a sister, the death of a son, the death of a daughter, the loss of relatives, the loss of wealth, loss through illness. As you have experienced this, weeping and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable, the stream of tears that you have shed is more than the water in the four great oceans. For what reason, bhikkhus? Because this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. For such a long time, bhikkhus, you have experienced suffering, anguish and disaster, and you've swelled the cemeteries. It is enough to experience revulsion towards all formations, enough to become dispassionate, enough to be liberated from them. Okay, so we kind of maybe see the connection between the first two suttas and the third. There's a way in which the first two were just setting us up for the third in terms of of course, they're not just talking about the loss of one mother, but that endless chain of loss that goes back without a beginning. So let's kind of talk about all of this. Um, you know, I don't really have any particular starting point with this. I think the one thing, you know, I don't want to get too... Um, philosophical exactly because last week we got pre pretty philosophical with the with the ideas of time no beginning cyclical versus linear ideas of time so we got all kind of philosophical that week or last week this week i kind of want to focus a little more on the you know the specific idea here of loss coping with loss in that way but also sort of the message of the sutta. Like what is this sutta suggesting in that way? So one thing that I want to mention really quickly though, that is, it's not philosophical, but it's more connected to what I was just talking about in terms of the Buddha uh, being funny and hyperbolic and all of that. So another Another way or another thing that happens, it's it's this formula or this kind of way, which is, what do you think? It's a very, very power. I find it a very powerful, uh, I guess you would call it a rhetorical device, but it's a very interesting, very powerful rhetorical device, which is the what do you think? And, you know, what I mean is, is that, you know, and I know that many of you know this about me and the way that I approach sutras, but I approach the use of the second person, which is the, the two, the two form, right? The you form, right? I approach the use of the second person in sutras, like very seriously in terms of that it's 
not the Buddha saying, or the sutra isn't, a, I don't think that this sutra is a record of the Buddha saying to the bhikkhus, hey guys, what do you think? I think the sutra is asking you, the reader, what do you think? And that second person, for me, it kind of breaks the fourth wall. Of, it, that's an expression, right? The idea of breaking the fourth wall. The second person in Buddhist sutras kind of breaks the fourth wall and says to you, the reader, what do you think? What do you think about what's about to be said? And it, if you read it that way, it can engage the mind in a certain way where you now are taking on a, a, a participatory role in the sutra. And this is for me personally, a kind of magic to suttas that is available. You can read suttas very, you know, like a book, or you can read them more experientially. And if you read, when you hear the second person, if you, if you hear the call, so to speak, if you hear the voice, as they would say in Buddhism, this, this is what they call shravaka. Shravacha is to hear the voice of the Buddha. And there's a way that you too could be a shravaka if you hear the call of the Buddha saying, what do you think? So I just want to put that out there, that there's an, an invitation for a kind of a deeper experience with sutras in that way. And then the Buddha is often asking the bhikkhus, asking you, what do you think is more? <laughs> and this is a trend. This is, again, another trend that continues in Mahayana sutras, where they keep this, what do you think? Which is more? Who gets more merit? right? A bodhisattva that does this, or, you know, a monk that meditates for 50 years, right? Which, which gets more merit? Well, this is this question of what, which is greater? The tears that you've shed due to the loss of mother, father, son, child, relatives, and everything, or the water of the entire ocean, all four oceans, and you'll notice, you know, the bhikkhus immediately replied, oh, all the tears. And the Buddha says, good. I'm, I'm glad that you understand it that way. To me, what that means is, is that the Buddha is basically saying, good. You understood the first two sutras in this section. <laughs> you understood when I said that there's no discernible beginning to the mother's. And therefore, it goes on forever. And you've been crying over the loss of mothers forever. And there's no beginning point of that in that sense. And so that's how the bhikkhus, that's how they knew that, it, the, that the tears shed was going to definitely be greater than the calculable amount of water in the ocean. Even though to us, the amount of water in the ocean is incalculable compared to, to the amount of tears that we have shed over loss throughout the long course of samsara, the water is very calculable compared to the amount of tears in that way. So that's sort of the beginning of it. That's the gist of it. I wanna mention really quickly a certain phrase in this, in uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, in this translation, he says, or he translates it as, <clears throat> um, which is more the stream of tears that you've shed as you've roamed and wandered on through this long course, weeping and wailing and so on. I want to just mention something really quickly about the phrase, the long course. So what, what I want to mention is that this particular phrase, the long course, 
when this idea gets translated into the Chinese Buddhist tradition, so in the vast world of Chinese-based Buddhism, they they refer to this as the long night of ignorance. It's a very, I think, a very powerful phrase for samsara. The long night of ignorance. Now, the reason why I particularly like that phrase for the long course for samsara is it really lines up and matches with well, the way that I teach the Dharma in that sense. And what I mean is, is that as you know, I'm always using dreams and dream states as an analogy for awakening. I'm always using the state of being in a dream where you don't know it's a dream. You know, you just think it's another day in your life. And so you're going about your business in a fog. You're going about your business in a dream, acting as if it's just another day in your life when really it's a dream, but you don't know it. So that is ignorance. The idea is, is that samsara is the long night of ignorance. And what that means is, is that every rebirth, it's just a new dream. <laughs> it's a new dream of a life in that way. But we keep forgetting. We keep forgetting the Dharma. We keep forgetting what's going on. And so we are lulled back into the dream every life. And so what's really interesting about it is, is that rather than kind of looking at like just the nighttime dream. It's this interesting way of looking at all, our entire time in samsara. Incalculable lifetimes. That all of that has just been one long night of ignorance in which we've been asleep and deluded. And when we're talking at the end about it's enough it's enough to become dispassionate towards formations. It's enough to uh, become dis, uh, to to become dispassionate towards them to become liberated. That would be waking up from the dream of the long night of ignorance. Because I want to remind you, the Buddha keeps talking about how we've been um, we've been on this leash, right? We've been on the leash of the five aggregates, going around the pole of samsara. Lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So it's, I like, of course, you know, just the, the, the idea of the long course, but I particularly like that Chinese way of putting it, which is the long night of ignorance. So, okay. That brings us to what I think is probably the most important and key phrase in the entire little sutta that we're reading tonight which is the line about all of our weeping and wailing and why from being united with the disagreeable and being separated from the agreeable. If you've read your suttas, if you've read, in particular, if you've read the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, the, the turning of the Dharma wheel, where the Buddha lays out the Four Noble Truths, you will recognize that what is suffering, what is dukkha, it's being in, it's being united with the disagreeable and being separated from the agreeable. That's suffering. Now, the idea here is, and this is going to be a you know a quick little, or it doesn't have to be that quick, but this, of course, is the basic teaching of the Buddha about suffering. Where, what's causing dukkha? What's causing anxiety, stress, angst? What's causing the suffering? Well, 
being <laughs> united with what we find disagreeable. Do, don't you think that's suffering? Being united with what is disagreeable? You know what else is suffering for us? Being separated from what is agreeable. That's suffering right there. Now, that the idea, of course, is that I doubt, I don't think anybody would deny <laughs> that that's suffering. Like being in contact, being, you know, with being with the disagreeable. <laughs> So, yeah, that's suffering. I don't think anybody would uh, disagree that it's suffering to be separated from the agreeable in that way. Yeah, Tanya, what's on your mind? So is that like a, I mean, it sounds to me like a version and craving. It It is. That is yeah. the, the very idea. But what yeah. we want to notice about that, Tanya so Tanya me mentions the idea of raga and devesha, right? The idea of attraction and aversion or craving and ill will, or, you know, however you want to translate those ideas. And indeed, the idea of being, this idea of being united with the disagreeable is, it's about my aversion, but ah! That which I'm averse to is it's too close to me, <laughs> right? So the the yes, there is aversion is the problem, but why is it a problem? Because when 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 where whatever we're averse to, whenever it gets too close, we get uncomfortable and we can't stand it and we suffer. Likewise, the Buddha warned us against craving. And the idea is, is yeah, desire and craving and wanting the raga, that works as long as you are with what you find agreeable. But as soon as you are separated from what you want, ah, now my wanting is causing the suffering. My very desire is causing suffering because I can't have what I want. And meanwhile, this thing that I'm averse to is like right here. It's all up, up in my grill. So that's the idea here. Now, what we want to notice, Tanya, is that if I were a little more tolerant, <laughs> meaning if I were a little more, or let's, let's go all the way with it. If I wasn't averse to or attracted to, if I wasn't averse to this, then it could get as close to me as it wants. And it's, I will not suffer because I'm not averse to it. Also, if I don't desire this, when it goes away, I'm not going to suffer because my happiness isn't contingent upon that. And that's ultimately, by the way, the Four Noble Truths. It's the idea that our joy and our pleasure are contingent. And our joy and our pleasure are contingent upon two things, being with what I find agreeable and not being with what I find aversive. As, per, as long as those circumstances have been met, I will be happy. <laughs> Does that sound sustainable? <laughs> right that doesn't sound sustainable to me because then i would have to be constantly associated with what is agreeable and never ever ever come into contact with what is disagreeable now tanya i want to really also encourage a kind of very buddhist approach to this which is just to kind of look at this look at like look at what the buddha is saying you know look at the Dharma teachings as they're being presented, which is like, huh, that makes a little bit of sense that like my attraction and my aversion work provided I can get what I want and I can keep that away. But then we notice, but that puts me in a precarious situation, 
right? It puts me in a precarious situation because my joy is contingent. And that's where the Buddha, or at least what I think the Buddha is talking about, is this inexhaustible, indestructible joy and pleasure that come from independence, not needing anything, and actually being comfortable and fine with the averse of getting too close in that way. Yeah. Cool. Noe, please. Hello. Um, <laughs> on page 645. <laughs> All right. Yes, the Eightfold Path. That's the Vaki, the Bukha. It is by way of elements that beings come together and unite. Those of wrong view come together and unite with those of wrong view, those of wrong intention, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, wrong concentration. Come together and unite with those of wrong concentration. Those of right view come together and unite with those of right view, intention, speech, actions, livelihoods, efforts, mindfulness, concentrations, come together and unite with those of right concentration. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> Me too. Birds of a feather flock together, like my, or great minds think alike, all of that. Yes. Yeah, no, wait. one more. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's strength in that. There's a strength that, that there's a strength that I get from that, you know, because when I'm on my own, mm. I tend to wander, you know, uh, I, I, I have short term memory loss. So, boom, I do it a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to come back to the idea of, well, what am I doing? Why do I feel this way? Oh, look, at, I'm hanging out with the, this thought or that thought or that concentration oh i'm thinking about that horrible movie i just watched and the violence and and this and i'm not finding myself compassionate mm. then when i sit with all of you and others and i find that compassion not only for others but for myself this is this is the uniting this is what i think is being pointed towards over there Mm -hmm. oh, that guy that guy over there <laughs> thank you for listening thank you thank you noe yeah that i can i can't help but feel that's very uh what the section or the little sutta that noe just read i can't help but feel like that's you know similar to parents who you know would really like their children to get you know have a group of friends that are about right view and right intention and kind of worry about their child getting involved with those of wrong view because they know the way that that affects would affect their child in that sense. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jenny. I think that um, in our practice, there's always a constant, well, for my practice, there's always a constant um, recognition of how uh, disagreeable and agreeable shifts. And so having raised a child, I can only hope that through hanging out with all of these people, he discerns the right path, right? At any given moment is... Mm it's an assessment as we go, right? Um, oh my gosh, yeah. So the perceived idea of agreeable versus disagreeable and how it's a constant thing and to recognize when within myself something's disagreeable. I was like, oh, why? If I just tilt my head a little bit so that the light changes on it, how it changes. Mm. And to go back to the the like how Buddha, like the Buddha we have in mind was kind of funny. Like how often is there an insight and we kind of laugh to ourselves like, oh my God, that was hilarious. <laughs> well, 
what was I thinking? So anyway, that's that's mm -hmm. it. Okay, thank you. Indeed, Jenny, I really appreciate that last comment. Um, I, I'm sure many of you, yes, agree with Jenny too, that some of the greatest insights I've ever had have been followed by laughter because it's sort of like, <laughs> that, like either it was so obvious or, you know, but definitely something funny about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Cool. So the one thing that I wanted to use this sutta as an opportunity to talk about, I so I, I want to talk kind of more specifically about the the what this is about. <laughs> this is about the loss of loved ones. This is about the loss of family, relatives, and of course, of what they are describing then is they are describing a kind of joy that we would get from being with our family and relatives. The problem with that is that when they die, then it is the greatest anguish, weeping and wailing. And why is there the weeping and wailing after they are gone and we are separated from them? because of this joy that we were getting from being with them in that way. Meanwhile, we have enemies, people we don't like, and it's all fine. That's good when we, they're not near us. Then they start getting too close to us. And I, you know, now, now with the disagreeable, or you could look at it just as a corpse is disagreeable. I used to be with my family. That was good. Now I'm with this corpse. That's bad. So the one thing that I want to talk about tonight, and I kind of would like to, you know, really talk openly about is, of course, loss, Buddhism's approach to dealing with loss and suffering loss. But then also by extension, what I think you might all find very interesting is I also want to talk a little historically about Buddhism's cultural role as a funereal tradition. I don't know if you know this or not, but probably one of the main primary reasons that Buddhism became so popular in East Asia I'm talking all of China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Mongolia. You would think that Buddhism became very popular there because of this enlightened, you know, this potential for enlightenment that, oh, we'll, 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 um, this is a tradition that is promising you, you know, superpowers and promising you enlightenment. Is that why Buddhism took off in East Asia and became so popular? One major reason it seems that Buddhism was adopted and became so popular, it was because Buddhists were cool with the dead. And that was actually not easy to find, especially seemingly 2000 years ago. What I mean is, is that 2000 years ago and today, of course, as well, but 2000 years ago, there was a lot more, I don't want to call it superstition. I don't. But in order to say what I mean, want to say, there was a lot of superstition around death. Like things basically like that if you touched a dead body, other people probably shouldn't touch you. <laughs> there was a way in which death was contagious. And so when these Buddhists came to China and they had no problem touching the dead, they had no problem being around sick people. They had no problem in terms of what we would call hospice. They were like super hospice people in terms of aiding people in their dying days, funerals, cremations, um, 
uh, wakes, right? M uh, morning periods. That's what Buddhism was doing in, in China, Japan, in, in for a very long time. It was not about getting enlightened. <clears throat> it was not about, it was about, it was about alleviating suffering. It was about alleviating the suffering of those who had experienced loss. It was a palliative uh, tradition in that sense. So what I kind of want to talk about is how, like, I want to kind of connect some dots in terms of how a, call it a worldview, call it a philosophy, but I want to talk about how the the message of this sutra about the tears, I want to kind of talk about how that mentality connects with then becoming a funereal tradition in that sense. I basically, I've already said it, and that's what, that's ultimately, especially the monastics, the monastic Buddhist community, by virtue of their training, by virtue of the philosophy, by virtue of the teachings, they were very comfortable with loss. They, they The way that I want to put it is, they were emotionally equipped to handle death in ways that not everybody is actually emotionally equipped to handle. And so because they were emotionally equipped to handle death and loss, they both could skillfully guide people into that process of dying. They could, again, alleviate the suffering of the living who had experienced the loss. And they themselves could handle the dead and not feel that they had become polluted. Which, again, I, we should keep in mind that in an older world, 2,000 years ago, it was a very special person that would be able to handle a dead body and not feel like they weren't infected in that way. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about that. Any questions or ideas just to start? Yeah, Tanya. But I, it seems that like they would also themselves not be afraid of their own deaths, right? Oh, because like, I mean, that's a big thing because I mean, back then there was probably some, I mean, it's still now, but people know how to be more careful. But, you know, if there was some sort of infectious disease going around, mm. I mean, you know, there might've been some superstition, but there may have been some. Oh, for sure. You know valid concern though they wouldn't understand you know they don't they didn't understand germs and all that at the time but but then i imagine the buddhists like they just i mean their own they didn't have they just they, they themselves didn't fear for themselves right yes yes that's a very good point that i failed to kind of mention was not only did seemingly the buddhist monastics not only were they comfortable of course with death and loss out here but yes yeah in order to do yeah, in order to do that, I mean, they'd have to be like, whoa, you know? Yes, yes. And it's part of what I kind of want us to sort of think about tonight is the mentality that is, that would be cool with that in a way. Noe, do you have something? Yes, thank you. Uh, there's a, the Bodhisattva path. Yeah, as you know, I bow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it, with compassion, to live a life of compassion towards others, towards all sentient beings. This is, you know, this is in the in the Mahayana and how compassionate of a person to be able to sit with someone who's dying, or to be with someone who's dying, or to comfort someone who's who's someone you know who died. I, I you know, I'm seventy years old and I've done been there, done that, and yet tears still flow. You know, yeah. they still, they always will. But so grateful to have gratitude and compassion for others and for myself. This is what it's taught me. I I, <laughs> I remember the old, uh, now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> if I should die before I wake, you know, it's a, it, 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 it point, points to this, mm. you, you know, to, to be ready, you know, and uh, yes, absolutely. You speak of the Bodhisattva vow or, or the, because this came mm -hmm. a little, little later. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, no, I was going to mention something about the, the Bodhisattva relationship to this. I'll get to that in a second. Jenny? Um, to Tanya's point, with the diseases, we don't know what was happening. You know, the Black Plague, everybody was super freaked out for a good reason. Um, but then we also have the monks who had the five remembrances, right? That this is just the way it's going to go. <clears throat> yeah. um, and maybe that's that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tanya. Can you remind me what the five rem remembrances were, are? That, Jenny. that, that Jenny met? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm of the nature to grow old. I'm of the nature to get sick. I'm of the nature to die. Uh, nothing, nobody, n no loves that I have, no things that I own will I be able to maintain. Um, all I have are my actions. Thanks, Jenny. All right. So oh. can I just that's such a great reminder. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you, Jenny. It's Tony. Yeah, Marnie, please. Hello. Just a brief question about this sutra specifically. It almost to me feels like I'm verging on like the thought of Dharmakaya, or perhaps, and I will butcher this pronunciation, but Dharma Hachu. I know I said that wrong. But am I just maybe my brain's just going that way because of stuff I you know, learned earlier this week, but mm. it's kind of leaning for me in that direction. Marnie, any anything particular that's making you feel that way? I think it's just about that. I guess that's why I want I wanted to just kind of clarify about like the dharma dharma hatu uh -huh. because that's you know more like that open space, right? That's that, um, you know, it's basically the expanse of all phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. The all encompassing. Mm -hmm. um, so, and so that's where I'm thinking, that's why I'm taking this as like, yes, death happens. Yes, we're going to cry, we're going to continuously cry. And, you know, we're all, this is just all encompassing. This is just part of mm -hmm. all phenomena. That's why I'm going there, I think. Yep, yep. I got you. Um, so Marnie brings up some very interesting ideas. Um, she brings up the Dharma Kaya, the Dharma body, and then the Dharma Dahatu, the Dharma realm, as it might be called. These are two very uh, I would even say inextricably related ideas. Uh, in many ways, I would even suggest they're the same idea looked at from two different angles in that way. Marnie, I will say though that, you know, the, that those two ideas, the Dharmakaya, Dharma Dahatu, are very, you know, Mahayana Buddhist ideas. You do not find either of those ideas in the early Buddhist tradition. Not to say that it's not to say that those teachings aren't there in a nascent seed state, but the exact terms and ideas of Dharmakaya and Dharma Datu you're not you're not going to run into. I can kind of vibe or feel why you might be thinking that about this sutta. However, there is really quickly, by the way super quickly, by the way, like super parenthetical bracket. All right. So everybody just hold on. 
in the early Buddhist tradition, we know about what are called the three marks of existence. This idea that all things are impermanent, there's no self, and all conditioned dharmas are suffering or ultimately cause suffering. Now, those three marks, the suffering, the or impermanence, I should say, and no self, the Buddha in the early Buddhist tradition was talking about conditioned, all conditioned dharmas, all, all relative conditional phenomena cause suffering. There's not really a self there and they're all impermanent. That starts to sound and it even is taught as everything is suffering, everything is impermanent, everything is without self. There is no self. In the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, what they say is, oh, no, 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 you guys, you, you guys, you early Buddhist people, you missed the, you missed the whole point. Yeah, the Buddha said, all conditional relative phenomena are suffering and permanent no self. The Buddha never said that there wasn't bliss. The Buddha never said that there wasn't permanence. The Buddha never said that there wasn't a kind of true self. The Buddha just said that you'll never find the true self or permanence or joy in conditional phenomena. What is permanent? What is bliss? What is the true self? The Dharmakaya. The idea of the Dharmakaya, the Dharma body, is, quote, permanent. This body according to our sutra, very impermanent. This body, suffering. This body causes suffering because this body's conditioned and reacts to everything. <laughs> A self here, not in the five aggregates. You'll never find the five aggregates. You'll never find the self in the five aggregates. Only a fool thinks that the self is in form or the form is self and all of that, right? So the idea here is, is that in the early Buddhist tradition, the Buddha just keeps talking in the negative. It's in the Mahayana tradition that we finally get the positing of something that would be considered uh, positive. And I don't mean that in a good sense, but just in the opposite of negative, in negation. What I'm getting at again, Marty, is that I wouldn't exactly think of the Dharmakaya in, as it pertains to this sutra. Not to say that it's sort of not there floating somehow in the background, but I do think that this sutra is a little more straightforward in terms of how much longer are you gonna cry over all of this? And it gives me the answer, forever. <laughs> well, <laughs> In a certain sense, in terms of Marnie identifying with the aggregates and therefore being on the leash and revolving in samsara, yeah, that's endless and forever. So as we often say, you know, or as I, as I often say in Dharma doors, Michael, Marnie, Noe will never be enlightened. And what I mean by that is, Michael, identifying as Michael, will never <laughs> reach enlightenment. So indeed, Michael, Marnie, Noe, all of us in that sense will always be suffering and crying in samsara. But there is hope. This is what we talked about last week. There is hope. There is liberation. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here talking about this if there wasn't the liberation. But we need to know what liberation is in that sense. And what I mean by that is, so dying is suffering producing, dying sucks. 
death sucks, it's suffering, all of that. And so one solution, what if we just could never die? Immortality, that's, that sounds like bliss, right? Because if, if death is the problem, then if I could just live forever, I would avoid that problem. There are some traditions out there in the world, by the way, that are going for eternal life. Buddhism is actually very interesting because it is not encouraging you to live forever. It's actually trying to encourage us to not identify with that which dies. If we identify with the body of form, if we identify with the aggregates, that then we are bound to that which dies. And if our identity is wrapped up in that which dies, then there is that fear of when I'm going to die because I am identifying with that which dies. But the hope here, the, the good news of Buddhism is that we don't have to identify with that which dies. That's not clinging to this ever-changing body of form as self. And I'm not going to go too far down this road because this is what we've talked about in Sundays prior to all of this, which is about the aggregates and what it means to not identify as or with the aggregates. So, yeah, Jenny. Um, I'm having a hard time reconciling this because we, in theory, we live in this physical space where the five aggregates exist. And it feels like we need to identify with being that which dies. Mm. Because then we're not afraid to touch a dead body. Mm. So I understand like in the ethereal to not identify with, with that which dies. But my physical body, the one that walks into the grocery market and gets half and half for my coffee in the morning because without it, I suffer. <laughs> it will die. I, I, I'm, I'm, so again, I don't, I don't want to repeat everything we've talked about in Dharma Door's past regarding the aggregates, but I will mention, remind remind you of this one subtle idea. R remember, I'm, I'm, I'm often using this as my example, Jenny, if you remember, and it's the idea of my cup. Right, 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 of course. Versus the cup. The cup, right. And noticing that the cup functions, <sighs> it functions the same either way. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. There could be this mental hang up that it's mine. Right. This right. functions and goes and gets cream and does everything it, it does, but that same mind could appropriate it. And that would be the same as if I'm clinging to this cup and somebody runs and runs away with it, I'm separated from the agreeable. And now I'm going to be like, no, my cup. But if I'm just using the cup and somebody comes and grabs it, I'm like, whoa, where'd, where'd the cup go? Right. Same thing as it pertains to the body mm -hmm. or teeth, for example. As we get older, there is this attachment to the body. And so when we lose a tooth, it's like, oh my God, I'm falling apart. Right. Or there is just change. 
but we want to notice the emotional, psychological reaction depending upon our disposition towards it. All right. I have one last idea that I'd like to share since it's actually about tears, <laughs> the title of the sutta. So I've also wanted to, when I decided, when I decided to jump back into the old teachings, right? Because these are some of the earliest teachings of Buddhism. When I decided to jump back into this, I knew, I knew I would be faced with certain problems because as I think you know, the early Buddhist sutras come from a more austere, monastic, celibate, renunciatory tradition. And it's only in the Mahayana tradition that you get a more, what I consider, well-rounded form of Buddhism that isn't as boys club, stoic, austere in that way. So the the emotionality or the emotional disposition that's being suggested in our sutta here is one of um, kind of neutrality in that sense and neutrality towards the loss of the life of loved ones and all of that, a kind of uh, upeksha, equanimity, that kind of idea. And I think, and because of time, I'm, I can't go too into this, but I did want to make really clear that for me personally, when I read this sutra, when I hear these teachings, I do not hear, I do not take it as I should be uh, neutral towards my family and friends. And then that'll save me from crying and the loss when I lose them. I don't take it that way. I don't teach it that way. I'm all for enjoying loved ones when they're with us. I'm all for that. What I think is helpful here, though, is... So let's say it's the day after mother has died. Now what? And what we want to notice is if we're Buddhist practitioners in that way, we might experience the, we might experience, of course, we're going to experience it. It's going to be sad. It's going to be hard. We're going to be, we're going to be suffering loss. But the teachings here are an opportunity to, to look at that loss and ask myself, why this suffering? And the answer that you're going to be given from the Buddha is, oh, you have been separated from the agreeable. That's why you're suffering right now. You, you have been separated from your, the agreeable. <laughs> And what I'm getting at is, is that this Buddhism is here to help. <laughs> That's all I can say. It's here to help with all of this. And so it's here to help with that loss by showing you, this is why you're upset right now. This is where the suffering's coming from. And for me personally, a, a tremendous insight that I realized through this it was about noticing, and th this realization came to me, well, I don't need to get into how or why or when it came to me, but it came to me, and the realization I had, because I reflected upon the Dharma, I reflected upon the teachings, and I realized, oh, I'm upset right now, I'm suffering right now, because I have been separated from what is agreeable. How selfish. This is about me. My tears are not for the dead person. I'm crying because I'm not getting what I want like a little baby. And that helped me 
actually sort out some emotions around things where I kind of realized places in my life where I was actually being very selfish. And I don't, I, I mean that in a way where <clears throat> this wasn't about the other person. <laughs> I was, that was an excuse. <clears throat> Looking more carefully, I realized, oh, I'm not getting what I want right now. And what that did was, is it, it actually basically made me shelve <laughs> myself and be more compassionate and caring for the deceased's relatives that were still alive and they had suffered loss. And in a way, being more like compassionate for the deceased in a, in a deeply, you know, deep way. And what I realized is, oh, these tears, again, these tears are not about them. They're not about the relatives. It's very personal. Something to reflect on. The, the thing that I wanted to say, though, when I, I started talking about early Buddhism being very much more kind of stoic and austere, I wanted to say something about tears. So there's a, a term. So yeah, things are about to get technical, like in a, a classic Dharma doors way. So you, you have been forewarned. So there's a technical term. There's a technical expression. It's used a lot in early Buddhism, but you see it and you find it in the Mahayana tradition. The, the Sanskrit word would be the anushra, Anushrava. Anushrava, I believe it is. Yeah, Anushrava means, I think I'm pronouncing that right or getting it right, but the term, it's usually translated as outflows. And so there's this idea of a of an ush, usharaiva or something like that, an outflow. In the early Buddhist tradition, an arahat, a kind of fully enlightened being, is known for being anashrava, no outflows. But there is... In the early Buddhist tradition, there is a very specific definition of what an outflow is. Now, it's it's in the language, which is it's an outflow. And what that means is, is it's it's an outpouring of liquid from the body. And what they talk about in the early Buddhist tradition is tears saliva and then either semen or vaginal secretions for women but an excreting of liquid sexual liquid again in terms of semen or vaginal liquid saliva and tears so crying over not getting what you want or whatever it is crying salivating over food like craving, and then, of course, sexual outflows. An arahat who has cut off all outflows doesn't cry anymore, doesn't salivate anymore, and doesn't either emit semen or, I guess, emit, emit vaginal secretions in that sense. So what I'm getting at is, is that in the early Buddhist tradition, which, again, much more stoic, much more austere, they were going for a state of emotional neutrality. No tears, no craving, and no sensuality or sexuality in that way. I only mention that because this is the Tears Sutra, and even though there's not a direct reference to the idea of not having tears, it is very much implied in this sutra that to be in samsara is to be crying and weeping and wailing about loss forever. And then to not be in samsara would be to not 
be crying in that sense. So there's this cutting off of outflows. By the way, of course, even though they talk about not having outflows in the Mahayana tradition, if you pay very, very, very close attention, that expression is only used in reference to monks and nuns, but what I what would be called shravakas. So people of the early Buddhist tradition, or as it might be called the Hinayana. The Hinayana is that more stoic, austere, no tears, no sexual secretions tradition in that way. The Mahayana tradition is much more warm hearted in that sense. And not to say that they are big about uh, crying in that sense. In fact, I will tell you this. This is another related story about tears. When am I going to tell all my tears stories if not tonight, right? So there's one other interesting place that tears factor into this. So you may have seen images of what is called the Pari Nirvana, the, the final Nirvana of the Buddha. And in those images, the Buddha is, you know, laying on his right side, right, laid up, reclined. Sometimes they call it the sleeping Buddha, but it is, it is, of course, the dying Buddha in that way. So if you ever see images, it's usually in paintings, but I have seen it in uh, reliefs. There'll be, and this is a Mahayana image I'm describing. There'll be the the Buddha laid out and in kind of at the foot of the Buddha in these paintings, there's all these monks and nuns maybe, but there's like uh, Kashyapya and Subhuti and Shariputra. And they're all sitting at the feet of the Buddha crying and their hands are like this and they're all like wailing. Meanwhile, standing behind the Buddha are all the bodhisattvas who stand with these serene, peaceful images, you know, their faces in these serene, meditative positions. And if you ever see that image where there's monks and or nuns crying in front of the Buddha and then bodhisattvas behind him not crying, that's actually a Mahayana critique of the Hinayana where the Hinayana people were worshiping the human person that died. And when he died, they were all like, oh, what are we going to do? And the Bodhisattvas are back there going, didn't they get the message? <laughs> Why are they crying? <laughs> so even though the Arahats are known for having dried up all their tears, there is this one image of the crying Arahats and then the serene Bodhisattvas who really understand the teaching of no self, the teaching of non-attachment, that all the teachings in that way. All right, anything, any questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of that? Bunch of different... Definitely a theme tonight, for sure. Cool. Then let's pause there. Yeah, I feel like we've covered the major points of the sutra. All right. So then until next week, by the way, next week, we will continue in this section. I'm going to skip one sutta, which is the next one, uh, Mother's Milk. That one, it's in the same formula as the ones we've just read, sort of about, it's sort of about in, in your lives, bhikkhus, how much mother's milk have you drunk? Is, is it greater than all the water in the oceans? And it's the same idea. So it's a very similar sutta. So next week, we're actually going to jump to sutta number five in this section, which is on page 654. And this is called, it's a sutta called The Mountain, but it could also be called 
the culpa. <clears throat> so if you've ever heard of this particular Buddhist measurement of time called a culpa, next weekend we're going to talk all about culpas. So stay tuned for that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Michael. You. Thank you. So much, Michael. <laughs> My pleasure. Happy to be here. Excellent.